which subordinate the sacred law to the transient whims of individuals and assemblies. And this was dangerous because such forms of human authority could never be truly sovereign in the sense of possessing that absolute and legitimate power that the legal concept of sovereignty demanded and could thus only betray it in violence as itself a perversion and indeed limitation of power. So let me just say in a few words what I mean by this. So if you think of sovereignty as being a category that is both sacred and profane, uh, uh, God is sovereign, the king is sovereign, and the king and God, as we know, are often connected uh, and have been so historically. The thing about sovereignty that allows it to be both sacred and profane is that it relies upon transcendence of various kinds. Uh, so the sovereign is one uh, who is not only justified by the law, who is named by the law, but also one who transcends the law, uh, who is capable of uh, either creating the law on the one hand or of suspending it on the other. And in modern profane forms of sovereign power, we see this happen routinely. The king or the dictator or the president uh, is attested to by the law and by the constitution, but is also capable of suspending it in a state of emergency, for instance. Right. Uh, so this form of transcendence can be profane and political on the one hand, or can be divine on the other. Uh, when you have an early Islamist figure like Maududi, Maulana Maududi of Pakistan, the founder of uh, the jamaat e islami party, reflecting upon sovereignty then, he thinks precisely about this dual nature of it, that it is both sacred and profane, that it implies transcendence. Right? Uh, you know, if you think, for instance, of the American president, whose sovereignty is manifested, even if only in the most extreme way, in his ability to press that famous red button and launch a nuclear strike without consultation. He does not need to consult anyone to do that. He makes that decision, theoretically. Right? Uh, Maududi reflected upon this and other forms of sovereign transcendence and argued that the concept of sovereignty uh, as it operated even in the secular world, was a theological concept. Now this, of course, is a well-known enough uh, uh, argument to make. Uh, but he goes on to say something rather novel. Uh, he says, look, it's precisely because sovereignty is, has transcendence built into it that it assumes such absolute power to do something. Uh, it's precisely for this reason that sovereignty can never be secular. It must always remain theological because no human being can ever attain to sovereign <coughs> status. Theoretically, it's possible to say that the American president can press that nuclear button and destroy the world. But in reality, it's almost inconceivable to do so without consultation, without advice, without severe limitations and compromises of all kinds. So Modudi looks at, if you will, secular or profane forms of sovereignty and says two things. One, that this is a theological entity. This category is theological. It is sacred. It is not secular. But secondly, precisely because it is sacred, it cannot really belong to ordinary men. No women, of course, are seen to possess it in any case. But, and what this means is not only that sovereignty should be reserved for God, but that human beings who pretend to sovereignty can only betray it. So for him, the reason for violence in, if you will, profane or secular societies is not because people have too much power. It's not because dictators have too much power. It's precisely because they can never really match up to the category of sovereignty that they seek to possess. That the category is too transcendent for them. So they can only betray it. Uh, uh, their rule can only be a corruption of sovereignty. Uh, he ends up, of course, saying, therefore, and the Pakistani constitution bears him out, you reserve sovereignty for God. All right? It belongs neither to the people nor to any particular ruler. And that's cr this creates any number of problems. Because if sovereignty belongs to God, how is it to be exercised by the state? Right? If you will, that's the founding problem of a country like Pakistan. 
So it's precisely for this reason, the transcendent and theological notion of sovereignty, that Islam is thought to reserve it for God and make of government only a fulfillment of divine commandments, a kind of management of society in which men were ruled by the sacred law rather than by other men. Right? So here is an argument which says uh, any attempt to instantiate sovereignty, which is a theological category, is bound to fail and result in violence. Therefore, we must, we must abstract it altogether. It belongs to God. No one else can have it. God is, in effect, absent from the everyday workings of the state. Therefore, what the state must do is simply exercise the divine law and interpret it at most. Uh, you, it just manages society. That is what the state is, man, is meant to do. Because anything else would be potentially despotic. It would lead to the rule of men over other men rather than of God over men. Like other colonized intellectuals, Islamists early in the last century often took their cue from anarchism or Bolshevism with its doctrine about the withering away of the state. But in more recent times, some have turned to a neoliberal model of social management by the market as well. So what I want to suggest here is that what appears to be a purely Islamic or Islamist way of thinking about sovereignty and how it must be removed from ordinary rule uh, actually belongs in a much wider context. Uh, one of these contexts is that uh, made by colonialism, right? in which, of course, you have people deprived of the, the capacity to rule over themselves, uh, but who are also therefore deeply suspicious of the state, the colonial state and the post-colonial state that succeeds it. And they want to often roll back the sovereignty of the state. Uh, and they think about or they imagine a society that somehow runs itself uh, without state power. And when they're doing this, people like Maududi himself think about, say, Bolshevism. Uh, because, of course, Bolshevism, communism, uh, communism has as its, uh, as its end uh, what Lenin called the withering away of the state, uh, uh, that you actually finally get rid of the state and society runs itself, or anarchism where you don't have the state either and which society runs itself. Right? And when they're thinking about Islamic law operating in a society, they're often thinking in these terms. So these are terms that are both Islamic but also global uh, and comparative. Right? Uh, so with, if I were to stick with Maududi for a while, I might point at an example that you know, Maududi is writing at a time uh, in India when uh, Gandhi and his politics are on the ascendant. Now, interestingly, Gandhi, too, is someone who wants to roll back the power of the state. He calls himself an anarchist and would like to see society manage itself, right? A minimum state and social management, which he thinks can be done through a society made up of castes and communities and other such things. Uh, Modudi, uh, interestingly, writes an adulatory biography of Gandhi, which was promptly banned by the British government. So the connection I'm drawing is not an imaginary one. Um, and uh, uh, there is no doubt in my mind uh, that the thought of these two men and that of many others are connected, though of course they are not identical. Uh, so Maududi is never a partisan for, of nonviolence, unlike Gandhi. So in both cases, uh, government was to be reduced to governance and the state deployed in an active role only in the beginning to replace man's sovereignty by God's just as Marxism's dictatorship of the proletariat was meant to displace the capitalist state uh, before dissolving it entirely into Lenin's administration of objects. So initially you have a state and then you wither it away. And when uh, the president of the Muslim League asked Gandhi what he thought of Lenin, uh, Gandhi's answer was, I would begin where he leaves off, meaning I begin with the withering away of the state. Uh, that's where nonviolence begins. Now, the problem with this deeply society-centric and anti-political vision was that it could never quite suppress the need or desire for sovereignty, which in Islamist narratives came to be understood as the most cardinal of sins, that of attributing partners to God or indeed claiming divine status for oneself. Because if sovereignty belongs to God, if it is a theological category, then anyone who claims it can only be... Uh, uh, can only be attributing a partner to God or to declaring himself divine uh, or 
anyone who believes in such a person is idolatrous. And this is how militant movements actually deploy the, 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 this narrative, right? Uh, that that uh, profane rulers uh, are tahut, right? They are uh, tyrants of various kinds. Uh, their sovereignty suspect. They pretend to be divine, but they aren't. Refusing as they did to recognize or institutionalize sovereignty, Islamists tended to manifest it in disavowed and so opportunistic forms of violence. For it has never been possible to establish a society on the basis of law alone, one in which sovereign power has been eliminated. These paradoxical visions of an Islamic state were in vogue until the end of the Cold War, when all such ideological ways of thinking about particular societies were put at risk with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the decline of its third world clients, and the emergence of a global arena for what came to be called social, new social movements. So these thinkers, whether it was Gandhi on the one hand or Maududi on the other, were drawing upon a repertoire of ideas that come from sources as diverse as anarchism or Bolshevism, communism. But this way of thinking uh, uh, enjoys a certain kind of collapse uh, at the end of the Cold War and the, the, the withering away of a certain kind of state, the ideological state. While in some places neoliberal ideas about Islamic governance took the place of older narratives about revolutions and constitutions, in others a new kind of militancy emerged out of authoritarian or lawless contexts. Of these, the chief one was, of course, Al-Qaeda, a global movement that has always refused to adopt the model of a state. As such, its dealings with sovereignty have been vested not in territories and institutions, but individuals, and in particular, the iconic form, the iconic figure of the suicide bomber, who both kills and dies to embody power in its, all its purity with nothing left over from the act of violence. So whereas these older Islamist movements use the language of the state, Islamic state and Islamic constitution, etc., they were deeply suspicious of the state, didn't want to claim sovereignty, certainly not popular sovereignty, uh, and therefore uh, had trouble in dealing with the category. Um, uh, there were movements which we see as political, we call them part of political Islam, but in many senses they were deeply anti-political. They wanted social self-governance. When, with the end of the Cold War and the end of the ideological state that was simultaneous with it, you have the emergence of movements like Al-Qaeda, which do away with the state altogether. You don't even need a state. Uh, and the figure of sovereignty is embodied elsewhere, but in an equally problematic fashion. In this case, in the figure of the suicide bomber. Right. Uh, so if I were to return for a moment to my uh, foil, Gandhi here. Uh, uh, so in, in Gandhi's day, the individual also becomes a kind of sovereign figure uh, through sacrifice. Right? Uh, so for Gandhi, uh, violence must go somewhere. Uh, he thinks violence is inevitable in all life. He thinks the act of living itself is, is one of violence. And he says repeatedly, the act of procreation, the act of giving birth, even the blinking of eyelids, etc., destroy the body. Uh, uh, and you die out of living, as it were. Right? Uh, so what you do with violence is crucial. In his view, therefore, violence must be turned inwards through sacrifice, through acts of sacrifice that will convert others to your side. All right. uh, you can't simply vanish away violence. You must somehow sublimate, he uses that word repeatedly. And he does this in the context of a colonial state whose primary mode of self-justification is to say that we provide you security. We guarantee your life. They don't have any other form of legitimacy, after all, because these are not representative states, the colonial state. Right? We protect you from yourselves. Uh, to this, Gandhi says, no, actually, I'm not above uh, recommending, asking for, and encouraging, and uh, admitting, even asking for, uh, death, nonviolent death, through sacrifice. I will oppose you, I will withdraw cooperation, and you can kill me, that's fine. You, or you can put me in prison, you can do whatever you want. And that is a way of, of, of fundamentally counterposing the logic of sacrifice and death against that of life that uh, governs uh, colonial 
uh, legitimacy and justification. It is also a way of claiming sovereignty in a sacrificial fashion, right? Because you're willing to play a throwaway with your own life. Um, I can go on about Gandhi, but I won't. Uh, with Al Qaeda, and Bin Laden, by the way, uh, interestingly referred to Gandhi on many occasions, always positively, and never negatively, a curious fact. Um, uh, with Al Qaeda, you have again uh, the importance of sacrifice, uh, but of course a violent form of sacrifice, where you kill, you, you expose yourself to danger, but you kill others as well in so doing. Right? Uh, and it, it, uh, that form of sacrificial sovereignty, if you will, opposes itself to a neoliberal world which is dominated by security. It's somewhat different from the colonial. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a form of, of uh, dramatically opposing uh, the principle that undergirds an entire political order. Right. So yet, so I'm talking in both cases about the individual, individualization of sovereignty without the state in this case in the, in the form of the suicide bomber. Yet like every other form it takes, this, the individualization of sovereignty has to be disavowed since it too threatens to usurp that which belongs to God alone. And this might be one reason why Al-Qaeda's acts are justified not simply by the sacred law they are meant to uphold, but as mirror images of Western attacks on Islam. This logic has indeed become gruesomely familiar. We kill your of civilians, including women and children, as you do ours. You know this is an obsessive form of the way in which Al-Qaeda justified its acts. Right? We only do this because you do it to us. It's a perfectly negative form of arguing. Uh, what we do, our acts, have no ontological weight or gravity. They completely derive from your acts. They are a subset of your own acts. Very interesting uh, way of thinking. Beyond trying to disclaim responsibility for violence then, Al-Qaeda's ubiquitous logic of mirroring is important because it defers and displaces the sovereignty of its own um, actions onto those of its enemies. Militant actions are seen as being negative in character and so deprived of ontological weight, with a positive identity they happen to possess derived from the deeds of their enemies. We do this because you do it to us. Only in this indirect way, it seems, are they capable of partaking in the sovereignty that must, must otherwise be repudiated. It can never be claimed. It must belong to God alone. Now, Al-Qaeda's deterritorialized arena of operations, however, marked by individualized, if indirect, forms of sovereignty, was put at risk by the global war on terror. While this war was seen as being unprecedented in its global nature, what it in fact did was to re-territorialize Islamic militancy by attacking Afghanistan and Iraq, and so defining its enemy in conventional ways as rivals for the control of territory. So the problem faced uh, by the West uh, after 9-11 was, who do we attack? Uh, who, do, who do we get from this? I mean, is it a bunch of you know, a few people, maybe even a few thousand, like scattered. Who is our enemy? How can we define such an enemy? How do we attack them? They are deterritorialized. They don't, you know, they talk about a vague caliphate, but they have no intention of instantiating it. They move from country to country. Bin Laden, you know, moves. He was in Sudan. He goes to Afghanistan, etc. Right. Uh, what the war on terror does is it re-territorializes the conflict because it attacks particular countries. Uh, and it, it tries to transform its enemy, enemy into a conventional one, if only by encouraging the rise of other enemies uh, who are dedicated to those countries. Um, out of this emerged not only insurgencies of a more or less familiar kind in both countries, but also a movement such as the Islamic State, which rejected Al-Qaeda's unfixed position in the global arena, founding instead a new state to which it gave the hoary title of a caliphate. While ISIS continues to draw upon the repertoire of its predecessors, making use of communiques and confessions as much as suicide bombers and practices that mirror those of their enemies, these have all taken on a novel meaning, if not lost one, altogether. So the American journalist Jim Foley, for instance, was repeatedly waterboarded and dressed in an orange jumpsuit before his execution last year but for no other reason than to imitate what Americans do with their jihadi suspects. 
for his waterboarding was merely a form of torture that didn't try to extract any information, while the tracksuit did not have the function of marking him out as a prisoner easily spotted in the event of an attempted escape. So these forms of mirroring what Americans do to their jihadi suspects uh, didn't have any function at all. They were pure acts of mimicry or imitation. And this is one example in which they continue Al-Qaeda's uh, logic of, of mirroring. This truncated form of mimicry suggests that the Islamic State no longer derives ontological meaning from the West, not least because it is overshadowed by other forms of execution, such as the burning alive of a Jordanian pilot in a cage or the casting of homosexuals from rooftops, which do not involve invoke the logic of mirroring. Similarly, the Islamic State's suicide bombers have ceased to be iconic figures drawing an indirect sovereignty from their enemies. And this, I think, is very interesting. They continue to use suicide bombers, but when was the last time you saw the heroization and glorification of the suicide bombers? They've become banal, uninteresting. Uh, the mimicry is truncated, cut short. Uh, whereas for Al-Qaeda, uh, it was only at the moment of uh, sacrifice, of death, that they could claim any form of autonomy, of sovereignty. Right? Everything else was in the care of the enemy. Everything else was simply a response, a reflection of what the enemy does. Only this act, the nihilistic negative act of death, of one's own death, was what they could claim for themselves. Uh, ISIS seems to have a much more positive or developed repertoire of actions which are not entirely consumed by the logic of mirroring and negativity. For Al-Qaeda then, Islam was represented by the medieval flummery on view in militant forms of dress, speech, and habit, which rehearsed the sovereign gestures of an imagined past in a kind of fancy dress. But these were always mixed up with other traditions of sovereign action, from the military fatigues of regular and would-be armies to the Kalashnikovs of earlier terrorist movements. ISIS retains much of this repertoire, to which it adds objects like the white trainers or running shoes common to American and European uh, gang culture, as popularized in rap music videos, and ninja-style black costumes from Hollywood films, both forms of dress uh, legitimized by its founder, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, during the American occupation in Iraq. In other words, the evolution of militant symbolism seems to proceed in two directions simultaneously. On the one hand, the conventionally political language of the state, and on the other, a social rhetoric of popular culture and crime. And I think this is uh, actually quite interesting because you know, it made me think of uh, uh, the book by the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre on Jean Genet, the French writer, who of course was a thief, uh, was a cr petty criminal before he turned into a best-selling writer. And Sartre, in this massive book, uh, writes uh, very tellingly about how these uh, non-political forms of criminal action and violence draw upon earlier forms of sovereign power, right? So kingship, uh, the church, uh, uh, you know, that there is, that these are forms of sovereignty which are not productive in the modern bourgeois way. Uh, uh, these are not about preserving or protecting life. These are forms of sovereignty that are predicated upon sacrifice that are potlatch-like, that result in a, in a great expenditure, right? Uh, you know, just as in medieval times, the knight or the king, the great heroic moment, the, the, ex the exemplum sovereignty is to risk your life and die, right? And the saint, the Christian saint also, the great moment for the Christian saint is martyrdom, right? So it, in both cases, an expenditure, an excess, sacrifice and death. Right? These older forms of sovereignty, Sartre argues, continue to live on in our societies, but in depoliticized forms, in criminality. And indeed, if you watch crime dramas even today on television or in films, uh, or famous pictures like The Godfather, you, know, you, you see these forms of sovereign action uh, all, uh, still present. So I would like to suggest that despite its establishment as a state, ISIS is still characterized by the old Islamist obsession with society or social order and self-regulation. This might be why its claims to sovereignty are so ambiguous. From a largely silent caliph attributed with little or no command and charisma, very unlike Osama bin Laden, the caliph Ibrahim has absolutely no charisma to speak of, uh, and he's not made very much of either. Uh, 
to violence exercised in ways that do not distinguish between the social and the political, indeed refuse to lend the latter any autonomy. So you have these criminal forms uh, and these pseudo-political forms together. If anything, the Islamic State derives its own indirect and disavowed sovereignty from its Shia enemies, embodied as they are by the Islamic Republic of Iran. For unlike its Sunni peers, the Shia version of Islamism embraces sovereignty and so politics, allowing for the suspension and even abrogation of the sacred law in the name of national interest or welfare, maslahat in Persian, maslaha in Arabic. Now, th there's something quite interesting. Uh, this begins with Khomeini himself, uh, where he says, yes, we'll have Islamic law, but Islamic law is not supreme. Uh, it can be suspended, even abrogated when necessary. Uh, so there is a form of transcendence beyond it, unlike in Sunni forms of Islamism. Right? But the logic of this transcendence is very curious uh, because it's public welfare, public good, which of course normally is, at least in the West and in other parts of the world, represents the norm that defines the law. Here, it represents the exception to the law. The law is, of course, the law of Islam that is given, that while you may interpret it as being uh, uh, intended for the public wheel, is not to be seen in that manner. Uh, it represents truth, it was given by God. Right? So the sovereign moment in the, in the uh, Iranian constitution is to actually abrogate, suspend, uh, or otherwise um, uh, 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 transcend the law through the logic of public welfare. It's, 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 it's a quite interesting uh, move. In the heavily sectarian rather than anti-Western narrative that defines ISIS, therefore, the caliph serves as an, uh, um, uh, as an antithesis to Iran's supreme leader, while the Sahaba, or companions of the Prophet, are made counterparts to the sinless Imams of the Shia. You know, I used to think for a long time that when you think about the revival of the idea of the caliphate, uh, you know, I used to think you could date it to the Bosnian War. Uh, and people started talking about the caliphate seriously again. I mean, groups like Hezbollah Tahrir had been doing it for a while, but there was no broad language of, the, of reviving the caliphate. Uh, uh, but I've recently been reading a thesis uh, by a student at Princeton who makes this argument uh, that, uh, you know, in places like Pakistan especially, uh, once you have the Islamic Revolution in Iran, the opposition to it uh, paradoxically takes on the categories uh, of uh, the Iranian constitution uh, and, and sort of, as it were, holds up a distorting mirror to it. Right? So the Iranians have a sovereign figure in the supreme leader. He can abrogate the law. Right? So you have to have a caliph. Uh, the, the Iranians have 12 sinless imams. So you must have the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet, who are privileged in a new kind of way. So the logic of mirroring shifts uneasily from uh, group to group here. This sectarian narrative had emerged soon after the Iranian Revolution in countries like Pakistan and ties the Islamic State to its Shia alter ego, the Islamic Republic, in a parasitical re relationship of violent intimacy. After all, the task of Sunni sectarianism is to inveigh against what it considers Iran's attempt to usurp God's sovereignty by associating partners like the imams or supreme leader with it. Right? So the critique of the Islamic Republic of Iran from the point of view of ISIS is precisely this, that they claim sovereignty. And they do claim sovereignty. They claim sovereignty and therefore they're usurping the place of God because only God can be sovereign. No supreme leader or imams can be sovereign. This is the crux of the issue. Um, uh, and you know Khomeini himself in his political testament for instance is entirely clear about this he says um, uh, the people of Iran during the time of the revolution were better than the people of Kufa in the time of Imam Hussein the Shia Imam All right? uh, so the Iranian revolution was so glorious that it's more glorious than even the days of the uh, of the most revered one of the most revered of the Shia Imams which means the supreme leader Khomeini himself is putting himself in the position of the imam, almost. Uh, so this is not simply a kind of um, uh, a speculative uh, critique that ISIS has. It's a quite real critique, though, of course, 
in many ways it's misplaced um, uh, and in bad faith. And yet it, that is the ISIS, can only do so, uh, can only critique the sovereignty that the Iranian regime claims by imitating the very innovations that such sectarianism abhors, with ISIS deploying its own anti-imams and anti-supreme leaders against Shia Iran which for a number of reasons having to do with its institutionalization of a clerical establishment and belief in the continuity of divine authority in a line of imams is the only country to have defined an Islamic politics in fully sovereign terms. Unlike Pakistan, which reserves sovereignty for God, Iran actually exercises sovereignty. Like the mirroring rhetoric of Al-Qaeda, this process of negative imitation imbibes a disavowed sovereignty from the world of its enemies, but in a way that constantly threatens to collapse one into the other, which may be why the Shia are characterized primarily by their seduction in ISIS narratives. And this is indeed commonplace in sectarian narratives. Uh, the problem with the Shia is that they are so attractive, they are so seductive, uh, you will be drawn in. So you must be constantly watchful. Uh, so there is a recognition, even at that rhetorical level, uh, of, uh, of the intimacy that exists between these enemies. Now, if the Islamic State's rhetoric is so consumed by the threat of Shia deception, this is surely because it recognizes the latter's seductive power, as I said. Traditionally linked to the Shia doctrine of dissimulation or taqiyya, which obliged its followers to assume Sunni attitudes when they were in a minority or under threat, this emphasis on secrecy has in the past lent support to an esoteric view of religion and in more recent times been considered a gesture of courtesy towards dominant social norms. But sectarian polemics have tended to paint it in the colors of hypocrisy, if not treachery and deception. And deception in ISIS rhetoric has, in fact, come to represent the most important threat it faces, as well as the chief accusation it makes against enemies of all kinds. This is another bizarre thing uh, when you think about it. You know, the chief accusation that ISIS launches against its enemies is that they're hypocrites, that they deceive, that they are false. Uh, there's a there's a, a dreadful anxiety about what lies hidden, what is concealed. Uh, and it might seem curious, uh, but it is in the logic of this disavowed form of sovereignty that I'm arguing uh, is at play here that I think this obsession makes sense. Uh, While the Shia might constitute its most depraved form, in other words, deception and the hypocrisy that attends to it have now assumed a more general salience in the demonology of the Islamic State. But why should this be the case? The Islamic State's fear of all that is concealed and its concomitant desire to render everything transparent suggests, I think, a deep anxiety about the sovereignty it disavows. The social visibility ISIS demands is always placed under the name of the law, insofar as every one of its actions, however bizarre, and repugnant is justified and indeed glorified by invoking scriptural precedent. What remains invisible, therefore, is not only outside or against the law, but by that very fact, something that transcends its purely social realm. Included in this transcendence is, of course, God as the sovereign power who founds the law and exists beyond it, as also the political sovereignty that Islamists have always suspected of usurping his place. If the Islamic State is therefore obsessed with transparency to the degree of publicizing even its most revolting acts, this has to do not simply with the requirements of propaganda, but rather a will to reduce everything to the social. Um, you know, in earlier days, uh, militant groups had, might have committed atrocities, but they would try to deny it. With ISIS, you have this the op the opposite situation. Here, atrocities are committed and publicized deliberately. And I think this is not simply for, as it were, uh, reasons of recruitment. That's too instrumental um, uh, an explanation. And why should such atrocities recruit people in the first place? And that surely is the question one might ask. And I think it is precisely because, uh, one reason I think this is true is because there is an effort to place everything under the name of the law, to make everything socially visible. Uh, to cut out any possibility of the transcendence that now resides in concealment and deception and artifice. Right? But the society, the social realm named by the law, defined by the law that ISIS wants to make forever visible uh, is not simply the dark matter of our regular lives that is simply given. Right? So even in earlier Islamist uh, uh, narratives, uh, 
what you have is a very interesting attempt to ideologize uh, all social relations. So rather than just seeing them as perhaps Modudi even might have in his early days, or Gandhi did, as something that had been inherited. You know, these are our social relations. These are the way, this is the way we live. We have inherited this stuff. We don't want to have the state come and interfere in it. Right? Rather than simply sticking to that argument, what they would say is, everything that is simply given to you is suspect. Everything that is simply inherited might, after all, be a sign of paganism. So there is a deep distrust of what is termed culture. Culture must be gotten rid of, and what you have is Islam, which is not culture, which is law. It's fully conscious. It must be made into something that is always visible, always in your mind, uh, that can never be just what I was calling the dark matter of our lives, things that we take for granted. You must always be fully conscious of it. Uh, so the social means something rather specific, in other words. Any deed that looks like it might partake of sovereignty must be made fully visible socially by being placed under the name of the law, as if in a kind of ex exorcism where ever more excessive forms of violence are rendered into everyday habits and thus deprived of transcendence. But the fact that such actions have to be made increasingly brutal indicates that the exorcism needs to be repeated at higher and higher levels, as if the sovereign power hidden in Shia and other forms of hypocrisy might seduce the practices of the pious which must constantly be brought to light by rehearsing and dispelling its transcendence. The Islamic State refuses the transcendent form that sovereignty takes in both its religious and political forms. Not only is its caliph a person lacking such sovereign power, so are the apocalyptic themes for which ISIS has become famous. The end of the world, supposedly invoked by the Islamic State's apocalypse, is matched and even countered by a narrative of state building and everyday vir virtues. So the movement's glossy online magazine, Dabiq, which is named for the site of the Messiah's return at the end of time, is nevertheless filled with stories of children's schools and well-regulated markets in Raqqa. Indeed, it may not be the end of the world to which ISIS rhetoric refers, so much as the end of Islam at the hands of its enemies both within and without. Now, imagining the death of Islam within history came to constitute a theme in Muslim thought from the early 20th century. This was especially true under colonial conditions when both the advocates of European-style modernization and those who were against it pointed to the fearful possibility of Islam's extinction if its followers didn't bestir themselves and return to the principles of their faith. Right? So when I look at uh, ISIS apocalyptic uh, Im uh, imagery, what I see is not some continuous tradition that goes back to the seventh century. I see something that is a 19th, indeed early 20th century form, and which deals not so much with the end of the world, but with the fear that Islam itself might be fully defeated and come to an end. And this fear, I think, is most lucidly and elaborately put forward in precisely in the early 20th century. You know, I work on South Asia, and there it's very clear. Uh, you have famous poems like the 19th century epic of uh, Maulana Altaf Hussein Hali, the Musadas, uh, that Madho Jatra Islam, the, this great poem on the ebb and flow of Islam, uh, or the uh, even more famous uh, poet Muhammad Iqbal's uh, um, uh, uh, verses, the shikwa, the complaint, the complaint to God, and the jawab shikwa, where God responds to the complaint. In all of these uh, forms of verse, and there are many others that could be named, the fear that is raised is one of, look, if we don't do something to reform Islam, or to make Islam strong again, it will die. And this is a new kind of fear. Uh, you know, I don't know of an instance where people actually thought this. They might have thought about the end of the world, but not the end of Islam while the rest of the world continues to survive. Uh, and it's this form that seems to be so interesting uh, to these people. But it takes opposing political um, trajectories. So for many of these thinkers, uh, this fear of the end of Islam was to be forestalled by westernization, by becoming modern. Right? For others, it was the opposite. It's the same kind of logic that goes in radically opposing directions. So even in, uh, so basically my point is that the apocalypse uh, is itself a modern form um, and has more than one political trajectory possible. Right? Indeed, Al-Qaeda's language of sacrifice has been replaced in the Islamic State by one of pleasure instead. 
No longer the virgins of paradise after the final battle, but the services of jihadi brides and sex slaves in Mosul and Raqqa is what militants are now promised, together with the villas and swimming pools that have always featured prominently in the movement's propaganda. Even its earliest days, I remember seeing these Instagram images when people were asked when recruited to come to fight in Syria uh, during the Arab Spring. Uh, you had this extraordinary proliferation of images of captured uh, villas, swimming pools, and people being invited, Muslims invited to come from Europe and elsewhere to come and enjoy them. So the Al-Qaeda language of sacrifice had completely dissipated. Uh, it, was, it was pleasure that seems to have replaced it. Right? So on the one hand, you have, you know, for, for Al-Qaeda, sacrifice was a way of dealing with sovereignty. Right? Uh, for ISIS, that is no longer at issue. Uh, here, sovereignty must be constantly made visible, uh, exterminated, uh, made social. The political world must forever be uh, wiped out so that social self-regulation is the only thing that remains visible. Uh, and in that society, without politics, uh, uh, what is of importance is pleasure. But such pleasure is also subordinated to the law, and there exist gruesome descriptions of militants explaining to the women they have enslaved how their rape is legally justified. If even this most intimate and commonplace form of sexual violence must be given the name of law, then any act may harbor a sovereignty that must be exercised by making it socially visible. It is the continuous rehearsal and repression of this suspect desire that defines the narrative of ISIS militancy, making the struggle of the social against the political the very principle of its movement. <laughs>